It's our philosophy. It's difficult for me to describe to you. I was standing in the kitchen when a bomb exploded. I felt that the world caught fire, as if the house exploded within us. I'm unable to stand on my feet because of fear. At the start of July, the Palestinian refugee camp in Jenin fell into the crosshairs of the Israeli military. Over two days, scores of Israeli soldiers, military drones and armoured bulldozers attacked the camp. Palestinian fighters in the area fought back. By the time the Israeli military left, 12 were dead and thousands were displaced by the violence. As the events unfolded in Palestine, over 2,000 miles away in London, supporters of Palestine gathered to protest outside the Israeli embassy. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Free, free. When violent oppression by either the Israeli state or Israeli settlers does erupt in the occupied territories, as it does with increasing frequency, Palestinian activists across the UK jump into action. They condemn the violence, call for the basic human rights of Palestinians to be recognised and call for the British government to hold Israel accountable for their crimes. This week on The New Arab Voice, we're looking at the state of Palestinian activism in the UK. What are Palestinian activists doing to get their message across? Are they seeing any success? And what can they learn from previous anti-apartheid campaigns? My name is Hugo Goodridge. Welcome back to the new Arab voice. The recent protests outside the Israeli embassy in London were sparked by the violent incursion in Jenin. To take us through the events in Palestine, I spoke with the new Arab's West Bank correspondent, Ghassan Muadi. What happened is that last week, the Israeli army conducted the largest uh, raid into the Jenin refugee camp in 20 years, uh, using more than a thousand soldiers, a thousand two hundred soldiers, uh, as the army itself uh, made public, and uh, using heavy machinery, including uh, D9 bulldozers that weren't seen in Jenin since 2002, and drone strikes and helicopters, and even F-16 fighter jets that were uh, overflying the camp. When such Israeli incursions occur, the proportionality of the force is often questioned. And given the nature of the Jenin camp, the scale of such an attack has again been questioned. Jenin camp, uh, needs to be noted, is a half square kilometre space with uh, almost 17,000 people living in it. And it's in the corner, in the southern corner of the Jenin city. So what happened is that um, the Israeli army uh, closed uh, or seized off all entrances to the camp and pushed its forces into the camp. Uh, and uh, the operation lasted for two hour, for two days, 48 hours, during which 12 Palestinians were killed, including four minors, younger than 18, and uh, over 100 were wounded. In the second night, uh, which was the night of last Tuesday, people, a lot of people were forced to leave their homes. Uh, all of them reported that the Israeli army was announcing inside the camp with loudspeakers that there would be more drone strikes that could be random and that they give the population the opportunity to leave their homes for their safety. So basically, they were uh, encouraged to leave by the Israeli army. All of them reported the same thing. Every single person that came out of the Jenin refugee camp on Tuesday night that was interviewed by the media, including by us, by me, by myself, uh, reported that. In addition to the loss of life and the injuries to residents of the camp, the Israeli incursion left a path of destruction in its wake. The, the damage in, in the Jenin refugee camp has, um, uh, you know, it's generalized. The main streets in the camp are uh, were raised. The pavement was t- taken off altogether, and uh, by the bulldozers. And uh, the the infrastructure, the, the the water tubes network was severely damaged. The electricity cables too. So most of the camp is out of electricity and out of water until now, until until this day. 
Uh, I just spoke to the Janine residents yesterday and they confirmed this. And when I was there, there was no electricity. And those who have water in the water tanks on their, on their rooftops continue to have some water. Uh, otherwise, they just have to buy, uh, you know, uh, uh, bottled water from, from the market. The public property, there was severely damaged. Private property, cars were completely destroyed and damaged and burned. Incursions have happened in the past. But the West Bank has not seen an incursion on this scale for a number of years. The build-up to the Jenin attack last week, it began at least um, a, a month ago because um, Israeli leaders began to speak specially uh, on the far right, uh, like uh, Special Ben Gvir, uh, Itamar Ben Gvir, began calling out loud and repeatedly for a large incursion. And, uh, and the idea was that for since 2021, it's like for two years, um, an armed resistance had been building up in some areas, especially Jenin and Nablus. And this year, it began to spill over to Tul Kanem and Jericho, and other places. So Ben Gvir and, and his camp, uh, settlers especially, have been calling more and more uh, um, uh, insistently on uh, the government of Benjamin Netanyahu. And this has to do with internal politics of Israel, like trying to put Netanyahu against the wall in an embarrassment situation to get some political gain. Uh, so Netanyahu eventually gave the okay last week to launch this operation and this case Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu spoke with reporters on July 3rd The IDF began an extensive operation last night against terrorism in Jenin In recent months Jenin has become a haven for terrorism We are putting an end to it So but the result uh, I I I really felt that the result was uh, actually that it backfired on the, on Israel because the people in Jenin, despite the destruction, despite everything that happened, the morale was very, very high. People were um, really proud of the fact that the, the, the fighters in the camp uh, stood up to the operation and that the fighting continued to the last minute. Uh, even one Israeli soldier was killed on their way out of Jenin in the very last minutes before they pull out. So this gave the people in Jenin the, the, the sense that, um, that they stood up to the Israeli army. So yeah, if, if Israel intended to, to break the morale of the people in Jenin, it, it actually backfired at them. I'm Palestinian, so I feel like we're kind of raised with the struggle from a very young age. Um, it's hard to kind of pinpoint a specific moment because I just feel like it's just such an integral part of our upbringing and like an intergenerational part of our upbringing. Um, you know, my grandparents were involved in the struggle, my parents and, and now me. This is Janine Hurani, a Palestinian organiser and a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, looking at women's resistance and mental health in Palestine. Janine was also named by her parents after the town in Palestine. But I would say that a lot of my understanding of the movement growing up specifically in the diaspora was within a framework of kind of um, like a rights-based or human rights-based framework. It was only a couple of years ago, pretty much since I joined the Palestinian youth movement, you know, I've started to personally see like the importance of movement work. You know, in the Palestinian youth movement, we distinguish between individual activism and movement work. You know, we don't see ourselves as a group of individual activists, but rather kind of a transnational movement that's connected across North America and Europe for now, um, but also connected to organizations um, in Palestine and in the camps and other kind of anti-colonial and anti-imperialist movements around the world. Through her work in the UK in organizations like the Palestinian Youth Movement, Janine said that the British public have been generally supportive of their messaging. In general, we're experiencing a lot of sympathy for our cause and, you know, regular folks in Britain and kind of around the world seem to be really supportive of the Palestinian cause, even if people might not necessarily have the language or all the knowledge to understand the situation, we are seeing like an increased awareness. This increase in awareness is, of course, linked to increased coverage of Palestinian oppression. Janine saw this firsthand following the violent Israeli response to the Palestinian uprisings in May 2021. Um, as well as my own politicization during that period, I also saw a really big shift in public perceptions and public awareness around Palestine during the unity uprisings in May 2021. We've also seen 
words like apartheid, words like settler colonialism, be part of everyday vernacular on Palestine, particularly like the, you know, understanding of the apartheid framework gathered speed after the amnesty report um, last year. Amnesty International's apartheid report was a major step on the path for wider recognition of Israel's oppressive policies. They were later followed by Human Rights Watch and the Israeli human rights organisation B'Tselem, who both came to the same conclusion as Amnesty. I think this is a really welcome change, but I also think that what that means is that the challenge now becomes contextualising apartheid as only one tool within the broader Zionist settler colonial project. So, you know, apartheid, occupation, all of these are individual tactics that together make up the Zionist entity's settler colonial regime. Working in the thick of British activism for Palestine, Janine explained how understanding has increased. And with understanding comes a greater sympathy and appreciation for the Palestinian struggle. This sense of an increased understanding was also recently exemplified in a survey conducted by polling company YouGov in May of this year. When asked which side in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict do you sympathise with more, 23% of respondents from across the political spectrum said that they sympathised more with Palestine, compared to 10% of respondents who said that they sympathised more with Israel. And when asked, do you have a favourable or unfavourable view of Israel, 51% said that they viewed Israel unfavourably, while 24% replied favourably. You know, we see people and they ask like where I'm from or we're at a protest and people ask why are you here today and things like that. We are seeing a lot of sympathy for our cause. I think a big misconception that I've personally been seeing amongst the British public is this idea that um, the Palestinian struggle is like a religious struggle, that it kind of stems from two religions battling it out for land. And I think that while we're seeing a lot of people starting to realise that that's not the case, that is still something I'm hearing quite frequently amongst, you know, um, your average punter, to use your words. While increased support for human rights and sympathies for those being oppressed is certainly a good thing, Janine has found that it cuts both ways. I also think that, like, while we're seeing increased support for our cause, um, we've also been seeing increased backlash. And I think the two are connected, I think, you know, because there is increased, you know, public perceptions and public awareness. And on the whole, I would say the Palestinian cause is winning. We're seeing almost like a, a reactionary response to that. One particular reactionary response that is currently making its way through Parliament is what has become known as the anti-boycott bill. While it hasn't been passed into law yet, the bill would effectively stop public institutions, including universities, local authorities and government departments, from making investment decisions that align with their human rights responsibilities and obligations. Britain's levelling up Secretary Michael Gove explained the government's argument to Parliament on July 3rd, when the bill had its second reading. Um, Mr Speaker, the bill before the House today does four things. It honours a manifesto promise that this government recommitted to in the last Queen's speech. It affirms the important principle that UK foreign policy is a matter for the UK government. It ensures that local authorities concentrate on serving their residents, not directing resources inefficiently. And critically, it provides protection for minority communities, especially the Jewish community, against campaigns that harm community cohesion and fuel anti-Semitism. No sooner had the bill been announced, it was roundly condemned by human rights defenders who highlighted the dangerous precedent that it could set. At a rally in London on July 5th, former Labour leader and Member of Parliament Jeremy Corbyn spoke out against the bill. And uh, as one who absolutely voted against this wretched bill on Monday night, not just because of its singling out of the Palestinian people for special mention within the bill, but because of the very dangerous effects it will have on our free speech, on our public representatives at local and national level to be spe to speak out on a boycott campaign of any country or organisation anywhere around the world without the permission of the Secretary of State. If this was being you know, the tools of 
Boycott, divestment and sanctions are three really important tools that we have at our disposal in the movement. They're tactics at the end of the day. I don't think that things like BDS or the BDS movement will liberate Palestine alone, but they are really important tools that we have to our disposal. What these tools like boycott, boycott divestment and sanction do is allow us to kind of shed light on um, how these big conglomerates, these big organizations actually create weapons to further imperialism across the globe and not just, you know, in Palestine. And so by stripping us of our ability to engage in boycott, divestment and sanctions, I see it as part of trying to fragment the bigger kind of anti-colonial and anti-imperial movement. And also what kind of precedent this sets, you know, if you start you know, making things like boycott illegal, then, you know, where, where do you draw the line? You know, there's... there's in their reasoning, the government has claimed that to boycott Israel is to engage in anti-Semitism. Yeah, I mean, we've seen the weaponization of anti-Semitism be a massive hindrance to our movement. You know, a lot of Palestinian organizers have been impacted by this. Accusation of anti-Semitism just gets thrown around, um, which is so dangerous because it, it really does kind of undermine actual anti-Semitism, which is a real threat to, to Jewish lives. It's an accusation that Palestinian activists in the UK have frequently had levelled at them, particularly with the adoption by some of the IHRA's definition of anti-Semitism that conflates anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism without any nuance. Interestingly, these accusations of anti-Semitism and, you know, these this use of IHRA definition we've seen so far largely actually targets individuals rather than groups. And the way I see it is that I see that to be deliberate because I see that, you know, by only targeting specific individuals, it makes it seem like the Palestinian cause is led by individuals rather than by, you know, a collective movement. The almost constant barrage of accusations of anti-Semitism have kept activists distracted from other activities, requiring them to spend time standing up for those who have been unfairly tarnished and seeking redress. Being reactive in this way um, when someone in our movement is harmed is very important we need to protect each other. But at the same time, how do we also make sure that we are being proactive and not only reactive? And so we also need to make sure that we're thinking about ways that we can, you know, get on the front foot around these things. And I think that's something that the Palestine movement broadly around the world is currently struggling with is how do we be more proactive when we are constantly put into a position where we're in a state of of reacting to the Zionist lobby and to Israeli atrocities and, and, and things like that. Despite the growing repression against Palestinians in recent years, the British government in its current form looks intent on providing almost unfettered support for the Israeli government, seemingly irregardless of how much it lurches towards the far right. This determination to stick with Israel is, in part, bolstered by the well-organised efforts of pro-Zionist lobbyists. So could Palestinian activists take a leaf out of their book? Can pro-Zionist lobbying be countered with pro-Palestinian lobbying? Janine is not convinced. Yeah, I mean, we know that, you know, electoralism, lobbying, legislative ac advocacy will not lead us to the path of liberation. You know, Zionism is inextricably linked to advancing um, world imperialism and which Britain and the US and other nations are interested in advancing. And especially in this post-Corbyn moment we're living in, we're seeing how impossible it is for pro-Palestinian voices to gain power within the halls of Westminster. And we know that this is because the UK government has a vested interest in advancing imperialism in the region, and that is incompatible with a pro-Palestinian position or stance. While not overly hopeful about securing meaningful engagement with the government, Janine does not believe that the answer is to completely disengage from the political process. But I will say that I do think there is some value in engaging in this work. And I don't think it's to gain power through the system, which is, I think, impossible, but rather as a potential avenue to achieve other political goals. For example, like through taking up some of these ca some, some campaigns that do engage in tactics of electoralism, lobbying, and legislative, le legislative advocacy, we can do things like, you know, raise political consciousness. They can become like conversation starters. We can improve the material conditions of our community. You know, there are lots of campaigns that we can put forward around supporting our community and their needs so that they have kind of more capacity and ability to organize. And also just because part of you know, social services and political work aren't, you know, I don't see them as, as separate from each other. And so 
yeah, I do think that there is some value in engaging this work, but it is a means to an end and not sufficient on its own. Efforts to end the oppression of Palestinians have continued for decades and sadly have been unable to achieve Palestinian self-determination yet. But it's not an impossible task. Change can happen and has happened in the past. But surely they have made a quite substantial concession to your point of view by saying, I think quite unequivocally, that there will be no further test tours with South Africa until South African cricket is played and team selected on a multiracial basis. I think that's a very important advance and a very courageous advance. But on the other hand, I find it difficult to believe that this is a consistent advance because if they said that and they really meant it, why didn't they call off the tour? Because this is a racialist tour. And this is precisely the basis on which we have objected to it, precisely why we have demonstrated against it. And I think we'll continue to demonstrate against it, although we might have to review the position in the light of these developments. This is from an interview from May 1970, ahead of England's planned cricket tour to then apartheid South Africa. Speaking was Peter Hain. For decades, Peter tirelessly campaigned for an end to the white minority rule in South Africa and for an end to the racist policies of the South African government, a campaign that he and his fellow campaigners would ultimately win. My childhood was spent in South Africa, the, the son of brave anti-apartheid parents, both white South Africans who found themselves jailed, then issued with banning orders, stopping them being politically active, harassed, intimidated, and finally forced into exile because my father couldn't work anymore. Peter and his family were forced to flee South Africa in 1966. And today, Peter is Lord Peter Hayne, sitting in the UK's upper house, having previously served as a Member of Parliament and holding a number of prominent roles in government. And of course, a long and fruitful career as an anti-apartheid campaigner. I was a member of the British anti-apartheid movement, which was the largest one of the many around the world. And the objective was to try to impose sanctions on white South Africa, because it was the white state that was imposing apartheid, a minority of the population who treated the black majority virtually as a servant class, not quite slave conditions, but pretty close to them. Over time, the British anti-apartheid movement was able to pull in a wide range of people into its cause, a factor that Lord Hayne believes was instrumental to the campaign's success. It managed to harness the support of a wide range of people, from bishops and business people, liberals, small L liberals, big L liberals, small S socialists, big S socialists, uh, centrists, Marxists, Trotskyists, Communists, a great range of people. And uh, everybody working in, in the anti-apartheid movement, whether they were clerics or whether they were trade unionists, felt themselves to be under a broad umbrella where their differences were less important than their agreement on the objective of eradicating apartheid and imposing what pressure we could internationally, sanctions on sport, sanctions on culture, above all trying to get sanctions on trade and economic ties and arms supplies, which were very important in sustaining apartheid. The British anti-apartheid movement fought their campaign on a number of fronts. Lord Hayne, perhaps, became most well known for his efforts to isolate South Africa from the sporting world. The biggest success we had early on was stopping white South African sports tours. I led a campaign through militant, non-violent direct action to invade rugby pitches and cricket pitches and tennis courts to stop, physically stop, whites-only teams that were South, called themselves South African but were really white South African teams. And the international sports organisations of the world had... Um, they been their allies for, for generations, ignoring the fact that the majority couldn't take part in sport and couldn't represent their country in the same way that the white minority could. Among the 9,000 people who went to Twickenham, there were two very different objectives. One from a minority to challenge 400 police and disrupt the game as far as they could, 
The rest went, in spite of everything, to enjoy the spectacle of 30 fine rugby players in action. But nobody, least of all the players, was unaware of the wider significance of the match, which many thought would never be played. As South Africa in white shorts kicked off, we all knew the result of the game would do nothing to resolve the dilemma of politics versus sport. Peter and his fellow campaigners were an ever-present feature, protesting at sporting fixtures, like this rugby match played between England and a white-only South African team in 1969. Similarly, Peter was also instrumental in stopping a tour of South Africa by the English cricket team. And that paved the way for two decades of isolation, followed in Australia the following year in 1971 and later in New Zealand, the principal white Commonwealth allies of, of white South Africa. So um, sport, a decisive victory was uh, struck. He also took his fight to the university campuses of the UK. Uh, similarly, the anti-apartheid movement led a campaign to drive Barclays Bank out of uh, South Africa to disinvest, initially by targeting student unions and, and student campuses by stopping Barclays Bank being able to recruit new account holders in common with all high street banks in Britain competing for student, much valued student accounts which would then go on into adulthood and later life um, and, and be loyal customers. Just as today in the UK, Palestine campaigners face smears and slanders, the British anti-apartheid movement also faced unfounded accusations. The anti-apartheid fight was seen through the prism of the Cold War. And because the apartheid state very cleverly represented itself as an anti-communist force and labelled all of its opponents, regardless of the truth, as communists. So my parents, who were actually leading figures in the South African Liberal Party, a non-racial party with members of all races in it, were banned under the Suppression of Communism Act, even though they were not communists, and referred to as, as, as communists. And because the ANC couldn't get support from... Uh, continental Europe and, and Britain and America above all, it turned to uh, the USSR, the Soviet Union and, uh, and China to some extent, but main, mainly Moscow. In the absence of support from Washington DC, uh, Moscow gave support. And so the whole struggle was seen and presented both by Western powers, by Margaret Thatcher notably and President Ronald Reagan and by the apartheid government as, um, uh, as a, a theatre for, for playing out the Cold War. And that made it, it hampered the anti-apartheid cause. It was not an accident that Mandela was released very soon after the, the Berlin Wall fell and the old Soviet Union collapsed. Today, Lord Hain supports a boycott of Israeli goods coming from illegal Israeli settlements, but does not agree with the recent assessment that Israel is now an apartheid state. I think apartheid um, was a unique form which should not, and that should not be um, misrepresented. There was nothing like the degree of micromanaged racism institutionally, statutorily, legally enforced by a brutal police state. That There's no comparison across the world. But I do think Israel has um, apartheid characteristics, notably its... Uh, relatively recent law which creates different types of citizenship, the occupation of uh, the West Bank, the creation of a kind of almost archipelago of different little bits of, of settlements on what is supposed to be Palestinian territory that has virtually destroyed uh, the, the idea of, of uh, Palestinian nationhood, which I support. So I, I don't think that that uh, the Palestinian situation and the Israeli or Israeli oppression of the Palestinians is directly comparable to apartheid in the sense that you can call Israel an apartheid state, but it does have apartheid uh, characteristics and parts of it, uh, you know, are certainly comparable with um, apartheid. Perhaps the label of apartheid is a question of semantics. The core remains the same. It's a struggle for human rights, a 
equality and dignity. For decades, Lord Hayne was engaged in this struggle and after much toil, was successful. Today, Janine Hurani and her comrades are engaged in this struggle and there's every chance that they will be successful. The success of Lord Hayne and the British apartheid movement proved what is possible. And in terms of lessons to be learnt from those supporting the Palestinian struggle, you know, you've got to realise that the anti-apartheid struggle may seem, you know, was eventually victorious, but it was it was a very tough fight, just like the Palestinian struggle has been a very tough fight, and unless the supporters of the Palestinian struggle learn the lessons of the of why the anti-apartheid struggle succeeded, and it is different, very different, um, but it was also very hard. Uh, and so I think some, sometimes people underestimate how hard it was and, and point to the difficulties uh, of resolving the Palestinian-Israeli conundrum and the difficulties of establishing Palestinian rights and the massive injustices and oppression suffered by the Palestinians and continue to be suffered by the Palestinians over the generations. Both are, are, are examples of injustice and oppression but both are also examples of very, very tough battles to win. Lord Hain is in a relatively unique position, having fought a struggle on the streets, as it were, and is now a respected member of the institution that he once pressured to institute change. So can he see a change in Parliament in regards to attitudes regarding Israel and Palestine? I think there is a change of mood. By the way, uh, there are Labour friends of Israel, and I'm a, a supporter and attended to events, and there are Labour friends of Palestine, and, and I'm a supporter and an attender of its events as well, and have spoken on its platforms. It's true that Israel is well organised, and the Palestinian cause less so, for, including for many of the reasons I've described, that it hasn't learned yet the lessons of the, anti, the success of the anti-apartheid struggle. But I think that the, the Netanyahu government in its latest incarnation is massively discrediting the Israeli cause. Uh, and the way it's behaving, not just the, the arrogant violence displayed towards um, Palestinian citizens, but their own um, Israeli Arab citizens, Israeli Palestinian citizens, if you like, uh, and treat, starting to treat them as second class citizens. Lord Hain does concede, however, that he has witnessed a kind of delusion among some of his colleagues at home and abroad about Israel's commitment, or lack thereof, to a two state solution, something that Lord Hain does wish to see. With the balkanization of the West Bank and the aggressive behavior of the Israeli state and, and its refusal to really countenance a, a Palestinian state, uh, it made it pretty unlikely. And now it's official Israeli policy to say they won't be a, uh, a two-state solution. And yet, you know, the, the Western governments, Western parties, including my own Labour Party, the Conservative Party here, the Liberal Democrat Party, you know, the American government and European governments continue to, and the European Union continue to talk about a two-state solution. I think people have to face up to the fact that it is now opposed by the Israeli government, that in any case, the practicality, sadly, and I deeply regret this, of establishing it uh, um, are pretty slim, if, if um, quite likely non-existent. Um, and so you've got to think of, of alternatives. And, you know, I think there needs to be a debate, an honest debate, amongst um, friends of Israel, as I say, amongst whom I, I count myself one, and, and supporters of the Palestinian cause, and whom I count myself one, uh, about the way forward. What about Janine? Has she seen the same shift in attitudes by British lawmakers? Or has she found them to be as committed to Israel as ever? I actually think it's um, a third option that you didn't mention, which is that it's getting worse. Um, and I think this is why, like, a lot of, you know, our understandings of the role of electoralism, lobbying and le legislative advocacy are the way they are. You know, we saw what happened to Jeremy Corbyn, um, people have come for Diane Abbott. There's, like, lots of politicians and MPs that have 
kind of taken a pro-Palestinian stance and they've paid a really, really heavy price for it. And this is why we know that, you know, we can see it's very it's very clear that advancing Palestine in the in Parliament is, is incompatible with the way that the British politics operate, the UK politics operates. So our analysis of electoralism, lobbying and legis legislative advocacy comes from how little of an impact we've seen or how much we've seen politicians and, and other MPs um, pay the price for having a, a pro-Palestine position. Speaking to Lord Hayne, it's clear what a monumental struggle the British anti-apartheid movement faced. It was a mountain to climb, but after many years, they ultimately succeeded. Palestine activists in the UK are facing their own mountain. It's similar to that faced by Lord Hayne, but with its own unique pitfalls and dangers. And as the Israeli state suppression continues to gather speed, as recently seen in the Janine refugee camp, they also face a race against time, secure liberation for those in Palestine before they are forcibly expelled forever. Final words to Janine Hurani. The trick to being more proactive is actually organizing 365 days of the year. You know, constantly, you know, in the Palestinian youth movement, we meet regularly, we organize, and only through this like consistent engagement with the Palestinian cause, not just when there's like, you know, news headlines, but actually the invisible work that happens beyond those headlines, trying to like mobilize and politicize our communities, trying to put on events that are not just in response to what's happening on the ground, but also just, you know, raising knowledge of like the historical context and like raising political consciousness of our communities and things like that. So I really think it requires a response or a way of organizing that sees our struggle is a long-term, everyday struggle rather than a response to someone being targeted or the latest you know, war that's happening on the ground and, and things like that. This episode of The New Arab Voice was written and produced by me, Hugo Goodridge, with additional help from Oliver Mizzi and Shahla Omar. Our theme music was by Omar El Phil. The new Arab Voice will be back next week. Until then, you can find all our previous episodes on all major podcast platforms. You can also check out our Instagram page and Twitter account, both at the new Arab Voice, for additional content. We also have a weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for. Find the link in the show notes. You can subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And you can also rate and review which helps us spread the word. Don't forget to follow The New Arab on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for all the latest news, analysis and opinion from the region. <laughs>